Let's start this week with a burst of action, a raid. And that seems like that everyone in the Confederacy, even the orphans and widows, have raids. But this is different. This is a Union officer. Brigadier General William Averill is sent through West Virginia to clear it of the rebel epidemic. This week, he hasn't done much, just scaring off small bands of men. But he's now just one significant step away from his goal, the destruction of rebels in Lewisburg and the demolition of the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad. All that stands in his way is Confederate fortifications at Droop Mountain. On the 1st, President Davis has to keep Bragg in line by writing to him about his disappointment in the Cracker Line opening. He also suggests that General James Longstreet is detached to take on General Burnside at Knoxville. This is an excellent solution to Bragg's problem of having good subordinates. Next day, President Abraham Lincoln got two letters, the first being a formal invitation. It is a desire that, after the oration, you, as Chief Executive of the Nation, when we set apart these crowns to their sacred use by a few appropriate remarks. It will be a source of great gratification to the many widows and orphans that have been made almost friendless by the great battle here, to have you here personally. No, kindle new in the breasts of the comrades of these brave dead who are now in the tented field or nobly meeting the foe in the front, a confidence that they who sleep in death on the battlefield are not forgotten by those highest in authority, and they will feel that, should their fate be the same, their remains will not be uncared for. We hope you will be able to be present to perform this last solemn act to the soldiers dead on this battlefield. And with great respect, your, and with great respect, your Excellency's obedient servant. The second was a personal invitation. Prescription, Gaysburg, November 2nd, 1863. To His Excellency, A. Lincoln, President, U.S. Sir, as the hotels in our town will be crowded and in confusion at the time for to the enclosed invitation, I write to invite you to stop with me. I hope you will feel it's your duty to lay aside pressing business for a day to come on here to perform this last sad rite to our brave soldier dead on the 19th instant. Governor Curtin and Honorable Edward Everett will be my guests at that time, and if you come, you will please join them at my house. We we'll confer a favor if you advise me early of your intentions. For respect, your obedient servant, David Wills. This personal statement proves that the president is wanted there, even being invited to stay the night at Judge Willis's home. With this, the commander-in-chief has no choice but to accept and starts writing those few appropriate remarks. The same day, we see growing anxiety from old Abe about next year's elections. He worries that southern states of Maryland, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri would turn on his administration. Not Delaware, though, because who cares what they think? In fairness to Lincoln's anxiety, there is growing war wariness. His administration has taken some very drastic steps that can backfire on him. Still, the elections aren't for another 12 months. We should probably talk about this year's elections, not that they matter. The Confederacy, despite its growing autocracy, is still holding elections, though the candidates are indistinguishable from each other. Texas and Louisiana are holding gubernatorial elections. Both winners are anti-administration, opposing impressment into the Confederate armies. There isn't much they can do. Next day, there's another election, this time in Massachusetts, and big surprise, the incumbent Republican wins, this time with 70% of the vote. Nothing changes. Man, politics has slowed so much during the war. Oh, the New York elections. And down the ticket, the Republicans win a turn of fortune from the 1862 elections. Their victory is a good showing for the 1864 elections in this probable swing state. States and assembly are so firmly in the unit's hands, there won't be a problem for the Republican senatorial candidates passing through the state assembly. I want to thank Dan Sickles for this victory. Yes, I'm doing the segment early. Despite being one of the most prominent New York Democrats, Sickles remained silent on the issue of the election until being forced to speak by an eager crowd. Where he supported Lincoln, unsurprising but valuable for the Republicans, and called for more volunteers, which again helped the Republicans as a significant issue was enlistment. Then for the bombshell, he attacks the Democratic Party, his party, and goes on to support the implementation of the Emancipation Proclamation and having ex-slaves in the army. Such a breach of party loyalty broke the Democrats. Having a former representative, current general, and beloved celebrity all but endorse Republicans and attack opponents of Lincoln? Well, I think the new administration has reason to thank the man. Now for some minor actions. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, there was a rebel strike at the town of Collerville. On the 3rd, they tried the exact same thing, a surprise attack, and were beaten back in the exact same way with Union reinforcements arriving. <laughs> now for some more action. Union forces in Louisiana are the 13th Corps and 19th Corps, and despite the rebel presence under General Richard Taylor, they're at ease. 
there will see an opportunity with their opponents spread out and begin a coordinated advance on the isolated Union Division under Union General Burbridge, which holds the Union's rear. Using surprise, the Rebels charge in and take an early advantage, with General Green's division under Taylor able to quickly isolate Federal forces and get the surrender of an entire Federal regiment. The secessionists aren't quick enough, and soon reinforcements to Burbridge stream in and the Union wins the day. The U.S. took 30 killed, 129 wounded, and 565 captured. Rebels suffered 40 to 60 killed, 300 wounded, and 65 captured or missing, about equal losses. The two Northern Corps continued their withdrawal, meaning the battle didn't do much other than prove to the CSA's army that they can still bloody their opponent, which is vital to keeping morale. Then for something spectacular, a rebel error that is almost painfully obvious, Longstreet and General Wheeler are dispatched to Knoxville. Bragg believes the Army of Northern Virginia detachment is unnecessary as there is no longer a siege, just throwing them away. The removal of Longstreet is only after receiving permission from President Davis. This ordeal screams personal problems as Longstreet can't be fired as a critic and outshines Bragg. But you would hope these officers could act more adult than middle schoolers. As we near the end of the week, we get a passionate letter to one of the most passionate generals. Executive Mansion, Major General Banks, Washington, November 5th, 1863. Three months ago today, I wrote you about Louisiana Affairs, stating, on the word of Governor Shelby, as I understood him, that Mr. Durant was taking the registry of citizens preparatory to the election of a constitutional convention for that state. I do, however, urge both you and them to lose no more time. Governor Shelby has special instructions from the War Department. I wish him, these gentlemen, and other cooperating without waiting for more territory to go to work and give me a tangible nucleus. Surrender the state may rally around as fast as it can, which I cannot others recognize to stand as a true state government. And in that work, I wish you and all under your command to give them a hearty sympathy and support. I have said and say again that if a new state government acting in harmony with this government and consistently with general freedom shall be best adopt a reasonable temporary arrangement in relation to the landless and homeless freed people, I do not object. My word is out to be for or not against them on the question of their permanent freedom. I do not insist upon such temporary arrangement, but only say such would not be objectionable to me. Yours very truly, A. Lincoln. I find it fitting to talk about what Banks has been up to. His past participation in the war has been in the South, closing off access to the Gulf of Mexico, which has been crucial in slowing the important exports of the Confederacy. The ports of Europe are essential for Jeff Davis to access. There's always that other border of the Confederacy. Mexico. The trade between Mexico and America might not be as profitable, but if it could be closed down, it would be able to cut off an access line to France. Let me explain. Right now, the French Empire under Emperor Napoleon no, not that one, has been fighting to bring Mexico under their influence. If successful, the CSA will border one of the two main allies they need. And with Britain applying pressure from the north, and France applying pressure from the south, the US could be forced to make peace. Or at least they could have been, before the Emancipation Proclamation. So why close off the border? I suspect it's to calm nerves and stop commercial exchange, both worthy targets. Let me be blunter. There is a continuous cotton trade that ends at Brownsville. Banks has been dispatched to close it. God, sometimes background is just annoying, even if it's necessary. Banks moves on Brownsville from an island. His principal force is under General Dana, who, starting with 4,000 men, pushes through the area. The rebels sweep before him as the operation looks like a success, and the advance into Brownsville itself is delayed because of confusion regarding the state in Mexico, the Mexican revolutionary declaring himself a supreme dictator of sorts over a nearby Mexican town. He stops looting in Brownsville on behalf of the rebels, but doesn't engage with the Union. It's just a mess. Long story short, with only minor skirmishing, the Union has achieved all but entering the town of Brownsville. It's a federal success. The border is secure. Well, about as safe as it can be. The final thing this week is Sherman marching to Grant. The cracker line has protected the supply situation for Chattanooga, making what Sherman has done useless. The man is running behind because he's marching with his supply wagons. In addition, the weather has turned dirt roads into waves of mud. He probably won't arrive for another week. That's where the week ends, and I think it's fitting to focus his conclusion on one thing, James Longstreet. Throughout this war, the Virginian general has proved himself and his departure from Bragg's army is disastrous, without even knowing the eventual outcome. I'm no confederate, nor a copperhead, so don't think I support Longstreet. Still, I don't believe he gets the credit he deserves. Overshadowed in the past by Stonewall, it's easy to forget he was Lee's right-hand man. It's a reliable war horse. Longstreet once again operates independently, which I think is foolish. The man is best as part of the Army of Northern Virginia. 
but General Bragg prefers a loyal army to a successful one. Will he even have an army after the next battle? Hello, it's the entire Sport Week by Week Team here. I know this week seemed a lot of differences. I tried a few new things, especially with script writing. Please tell me if you liked it. And if you didn't, I would also like to hear it. Like, comment, subscribe. You know what I want. And I hope to see you most of all next week.